Part of the fun of vintage computing is trying out technology you've never experienced before. I had zero knowledge about Sun's line of systems, but decided to give one a shot anyway. Little did I realize, it would not be a great experience. I was given a SparkStation IPX to check out. It dates back to 1991 and was a low-cost offering in Sun's lineup, though that term is relative considering it was priced at about $12,000. This wasn't a typical PC by any means, but rather a professional workstation, and came at a time when that market leveraged a lot of custom or proprietary technology, at least compared to now. This is strongly hinted at through the port selection on the back. SCSI, AUI, two mini DIN serial ports, 13W3 video, and custom interfaces for keyboard, mouse, and audio. There's also a pair of expansion slots we'll take a look at later, with one of the blanking covers having gone missing. What's also not here is a floppy drive, though I've got some ideas about dealing with that. The IPX uses what was colloquially known as the lunchbox case, and it opens like one too. The drives and power supply reside in the top, with the motherboard on the bottom, and just a few cables connect the two. The internal drive uses a SCSI interface, though who knows what kind of shape this one is in nearly 35 years later. I wanted to take a look at the power supply as some research had suggested it would be a point of concern. A single screw holds in the metal drive cage, which then just hinges out. From there, I could slide the PSU away from the back and lift it out as well. Yuck, this thing is really dusty. This IPX must have seen a lot of use. Screws on either end secure the PSU's cover, then I used a screwdriver to pry it free. It's pretty dusty inside too, though not the worst I've seen. I needed to get a good look at the PCB, so more screws came out next, and a few cable harnesses got disconnected. This power supply was made for Sun by Sony, and the primary side looked fine, albeit dusty. But the secondary or DC side was far worse. These capacitors must have been leaking for a long time. Everything on the top side of the board was coated in a horrible mix of electrolyte and dust. Cleaning the board wouldn't be enough, many of these traces would need repair, and I was questioning whether that would even be worth it. Sony made good products back then, but they sure didn't pick very good capacitors. Luckily, I came across an open source project that would give me a better solution. It's a replacement circuit board that uses self-contained power supply modules. I got some of the PCBs fabricated, and while they do use some surface mount parts, they didn't look too tricky to install. It's a pair of chips and a few passives entirely on the DC side, and with some good flux and magnification, I think I did an okay job. To complete the build, I needed to reuse a few parts from the original PSU board. The wiring harness, relay, and some connectors. Along with them, I of course needed these, the modular DC supplies that actually did the work. But it was all through-hole soldering and came together easily. I wish I could say installing this new board in the PSU housing was just as painless. There wasn't quite enough room due to the AC connectors, and I found that the hole spacing on the PCB was just slightly off, which meant that one side didn't line up correctly. But I got the screws on the primary side in, so the board was secure enough, and after reinstalling the ground lead, I could button up the enclosure. When I work on power supplies, I like to test them for the first time in the garage. If the magic smoke gets let out, at least it won't make the house stink. But I plugged it in, and it came to life without any drama. We should be good to go here. Next up, I wanted to deal with the hard drive. I decided to install a blue SCSI for a couple reasons. It would, of course, be a more reliable option than the original mechanical unit, which was a 525 megabyte model from Seagate, but also make installing the OS and software easier through its virtual CD-ROM functionality. 
I needed to 3D print a bracket so that the blue SCSI would fit in the drive cage, and I've included a link to it in the description if you're interested. That just left me with the floppy drive. I didn't have one, and honestly didn't need one, but I also didn't want to just leave the slot in the front of the case wide open. So I designed another bracket, this time to hold one of these SD card extenders for the blue SCSI. I took it apart and used some strong double-sided tape to stick it to the bracket, then slid the whole thing into the cage and screwed it in place. I got the drive cage reinstalled in the top cover and tucked away the drive power cables since they wouldn't be needed. I had blown all the dust out of the bottom case and things looked quite clean. While I had gotten unlucky with the power supply, the motherboard redeemed itself by not having any electrolytic caps on it. The IPX apparently went by the development codenamed Hobbs, so it's a nice easter egg to see a cat printed on the silkscreen. It also has a bit of weird side history too. By the 1990s, Sun was allowing third-party manufacturers to build SparkStation clones. Alongside the full IPX computer, Sun also offered just its motherboard for manufacturers to buy, with the idea that it could be used as the basis for an embedded device. They named it the Spark Engine IPX, and a company called RDI used it in its Brightlight IPX laptop. Sun never made portable systems of its own, so the Brightlight was one of very few Spark-based notebook models to ever hit the market. There's a lot of custom silicon on this motherboard, but perhaps the most unique is the CPU itself. Sun Systems at the time used Spark processors, which used the RISC or Reduced Instruction Set Computing architecture. This helped them perform better than CPUs from companies like Motorola or Intel, and this one is clocked at 40 MHz. It wasn't the only RISC-based CPU on the market at the time, but until the PowerPC came along later into the 1990s, it was one of the most recognizable names. The IPX came with four RAM slots that accept 72-pin memory modules, up to a total of 128 megabytes, a serious amount for 1991. This machine has two 16-meg SIMs in it, which would still be plenty for my uses, so I didn't feel the need to upgrade further. But one thing I did want to address was networking, specifically this port on the back. It's known as AUI, or Attachment Unit Interface, and the idea was that you would plug in a transceiver of whatever flavor of Ethernet you were using at the time, twisted pair or coaxial. But I find AUI adapters annoying to deal with, and there was that missing expansion slot cover to address anyway. So I picked up a card with four 10Base-T ports on it, and plugged it into one of the two S-Bus expansion connectors on the motherboard. This may seem like a weird thing to add, but Sun systems were used for all sorts of purposes, such as web servers. Even if I never connect this thing to a network, at least it looks pretty cool. There's one more repair I would have needed to make, except it was already done for me. Spark stations of this vintage don't have clock batteries. Instead, they use these timekeeper chips that merge the real-time clock, some NVRAM, and a battery all into one package. Just like with Dallas clock chips and PCs, this presents a problem when the battery inevitably dies. It's possible to buy new versions of these chips, but they've been updated to store the century part of the year, and that's something the Spark Station can't quite handle. The best solution is to do what was done here remove the battery from the top of the chip, and fit a new one. This is a modern PCB from Glitchworks that lets you use a replaceable coin cell, and while they're not too difficult to install, they also offer a service to do it for you. I found a problem when I went to close the system up. The lid wouldn't hook into the tabs at the front. Looks like I forgot to take this into account when I designed the floppy drive bracket, so I whipped up a new revision. This one has a notch in it to keep that whole area clear, and after swapping it into the drive bay, the case closes up just fine. You can hardly tell it's an SD card reader now. Of course, there's a link in the description for this too. I was given a keyboard and mouse with the system, which is good since Sun had its own proprietary interface for these. 
They're normal enough, but with some small tweaks. The mouse has three buttons and connects through the keyboard like a Mac did at the time, and the keyboard itself has some extra keys for convenience. Things like cut, copy, and paste, along with audio volume. Last up was dealing with video. The IPX came with built-in graphics in the form of the GX chipset. Thus, it has a monitor connection on the back, but Sun liked to use 13W3 for this instead of regular VGA. I picked up an adapter that came in wonderfully generic packaging. This reminds me of locally owned computer stores. Remember those? After getting my monitor connected, I flipped the power switch and... Yeah, a beep, but nothing else. The monitor never came out of standby, so I suspected it was maybe something with the adapter. I had read that Sun Systems use Sync on Green for their video, but looking through the spec sheet for my particular Trinitron showed that it did indeed support that. The fact the computer beeped when powered on and the green LED lit up suggested that power was not the issue, and when I tested with my multimeter, the voltage rails all looked okay. The problem wasn't the power supply. So I bought a bunch more stuff to help with troubleshooting. I had read that not all 13W3 adapters were created equal, as some manufacturers, like Sun and Silicon Graphics, used different pinouts. This one has a set of dip switches that allow you to configure it however you want, but I'd also need yet another adapter as the video cable on my monitor is built in. Would this finally get me some video output? Ugh, main screen turn on! Nope, the exact same behavior as before. The LEDs on the keyboard blinked when I turned the system on, so my gut told me there was definitely some signs of life. So the next cable came into play. It has a mini DIN serial connector, and I could plug the other end into a modern USB adapter. If you power on a spark station without the keyboard attached, it'll instead redirect the output to a serial console, with the assumption you're running the machine headless. And I certainly did get some output when I powered the IPX on, but not much. It seemed to be halting at this point. Out of curiosity, I tried pulling that timekeeper chip to see if anything changed, and it did. Some additional tests were shown, but it stopped again at the same spot where it looked like a test was failing. Then it hit me. That reference to UO207 wasn't some sort of internal address, but rather a component locator. Sure enough, on the motherboard, there's an IC at location U0207, and it's a RAM chip like the test was indicating. But this is where my journey suddenly and seriously derailed. That chip is very old and no longer being made. What's worse, it apparently wasn't very commonly used as none of the specialty component suppliers I checked with even had a listing for it. I suspect it's part of the video circuitry, which would explain why I never got anything on screen. I briefly considered picking up a video card to throw in the other S-Bus slot, thinking that maybe I could work around the problem. But I changed my mind. There's a saying I'm fond of, don't throw good money after bad. That is, don't succumb to the sunk cost fallacy, where you keep investing in a situation that isn't worth it. The same applies to your time, too, and I realized I was clearly at that point. I had already spent several hundred dollars so far, and there was no promise another video card would fix the problem. Even finding a replacement RAM chip couldn't guarantee success. What if more than one was bad, or another part of the system had a different issue as well? This is one of the major concerns around dealing with bespoke hardware that wasn't sold in mass quantities. There just aren't a ton of spare parts out there for these systems. As I pondered my options, I decided I'd already gone above and beyond for this machine, at least for my own use case. What would I even do with this thing, assuming I got it working? That's a phrase often uttered by people who aren't involved in vintage computing, but one I think even enthusiasts need to ask themselves sometimes. In this case, I'd probably struggle to install Solaris, ultimately succeed, spend a few minutes poking around the OS, then put the machine away. Sure, seeing it through to completion makes for good YouTube content, but personally, it wouldn't be that fulfilling. I don't have any nostalgia towards these machines. I definitely think they're cool and Sun played a large part in the adoption of the internet, but 
This IPX isn't something I'd pull out and use regularly. It's just not where my interests lie, and that's okay. I'd rather stop now, as disappointing as that is, so I can pivot to something else that hopefully wouldn't keep fighting me. Who knows, maybe I'll end up with a spare motherboard someday, or perhaps this system could serve as a parts machine. It's got a brand new power supply, after all. Or maybe I'll do something crazy and turn it into a mini ITX case for an awesome sleeper PC. There's lots of options. But for now, at least, this IPX has simply lost its spark. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Here's another episode you should check out, and as always, thanks for watching.